To me, I really greatly appreciate it. It's, it gladdens my heart. And you put a smile on my face. Amen. You've really comforted me. And I feel very much encouraged this afternoon. I'm so excited that you have been grateful for all that God has used me to do in your lives. I won't fail you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Are we ready for his word? The Bible says he has exalted his word above even his name. And so this moment we want to pray that God will anoint the teaching of his word. We will leave this place edified, empowered, inspired, and we pray in Jesus' name that every life here will be touched. In Jesus' name, amen. Somebody shout amen. amen. Give someone a high five and tell the person, welcome to church. And welcome to a very special Father's Day service. Your life will not be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Put your hands together for the junior choir. Psalmist, as they take their seats. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Amen. And, and for the evangelist for such a powerful ministration. Amen. Please take your seats in Jesus' name. I want to speak to you on the Father's love. The Father's love. Fathers are very special creatures that God made. And the Father's love is a very powerful aspect of the Father. Everyone who God created as Father has so many qualities and the reason for the father is for the betterment of everyone that came out of the father. In a technical sense, the wife is actually a product of the father. You see, Eve came out of Adam. So in one sense, she is wife. At the same time, she is daughter. And then children also come out. So for the man, the male that God created, the quality of a father is that he is source. And because he is source, fathers are supposed to sustain things too. They also nourish the things that come out of them. They're supposed to take care of the things that come out of them. Their qualities are to sustain the earth. And to sustain everything that came out. And that's why the father has been a subject of Satan's attack. Even in our society, we see an attack on fathers. But where my focus is this afternoon is the fact that there is a particular aspect of a father. And that is the father's love. Everybody needs a father's love. When the father's love is truly at work, it makes a child's life better. When the father's love is at play, it changes the game for a child. It changes the game for a home. There is no woman in a home who would love the husband to love her, but the husband should not love the children. It doesn't make the woman feel well. So you realize that the father's love, 
if it is not really on display, can even affect a wife and affect the children. And everyone that was created, when there is no father's love, that child, would take, it would take a special grace of God to position someone else in their life to offer them that one so that they will be well. So that they will turn out well. Because when the father's love is at well, at work, it changes the emotional state of the person. Now, you see, we are spirits, we have a soul, and we live in a body. When something happens to your soul, which is the emotional aspect of you, it affects the body. It affects the body. Our emotional well-being is as paramount as our physical well-being. But everybody's physical well-being is linked up to their emotional well-being. If emotionally we are not well, physically we won't be well. There are many diseases, there are many mental health diseases as a result of emotional illness or emotional wounds or people who have been hurt emotionally. And especially when a father's love is not at work and is not at play, something affects the emotions of the people. And when someone's emotions has been affected from childhood, it has a way of affecting them as they grow. When there's no father's love, sometimes it results in timid children. It also results in angry children. It also produces vengeful children. It produces some, something is not right in that person's life because the father's love is supposed to nurture. The father's love is supposed to protect. The father's love is supposed to provide. The father's love is supposed to sustain. The father's love is like the oxygen that everybody needs. And in, sometimes in many, many places, Many young people are suffering because there has not been a father's love. Sometimes there is the absence of a father completely. They grow up without knowing their father. And it has a way it hurts. And it affects so many things. Sometimes it affects relationships. Because they haven't known how a father's love is. So sometimes they are not able to love their spouses. Because they haven't seen it before. They don't know what it is. And so when they also have children, they don't know how to give that one to them. They haven't seen it before. Both male and females need a father's love. Sometimes ladies who haven't had a father or haven't had a father's love. And sometimes the truth is that there are absentee fathers which has got its own consequences. And there are fathers who are physically present but they don't know how to give a father's love. So when the daughter grows up, a daughter naturally looks up to a father. Because if she doesn't see a father, she won't know how to handle a man. And so God placed these things in a father so that he can do that. But then sometimes things don't go the way it is planned. And many people have suffered. There are many people who have got physical fathers at home, but those fathers don't know how to give the father's love. They don't know how to be there for the child. They don't know how to minister it. They, they are not there. They are totally absent. They don't give love. You can't give what you have not been given. You can't give love when, when your father hasn't given you love. You don't know how to do it. And so sometimes it's not your fault. But when these things happen, internally, emotionally, the person is going through some things. When the father is absent and the father's love is absent, absent, the person's protection is gone because naturally, the father is a protector. He's supposed to be a protector. When a father fails to protect, you leave your children so vulnerable. And when they become vulnerable and they mess up, they become angry. And when they don't know how to handle themselves, they move from one problem to the other, one danger to the next, because there's no one there. And it has a way that it affects, the moment something affects your emotional well-being, it has a way of affecting any dream that you have in life. Sometimes it results in timidity. You are not confident in yourself, because a father's love is supposed to give confidence and boost someone's, you know, Ability to move to the next level. The assuring words of a father is needed by every child. 
everyone needs that voice. But thank God for the father that we have. Amen. That when our physical fathers fail, he's able to put in substitutes. This afternoon, I will pray for some people here. That you will be healed in Jesus' name. Amen. But let us read a scripture. In Luke chapter 15, verse 11 to 32. I pray that God will help me to discharge what he has asked me to do this afternoon. Because we will need some time to pray in Jesus' name. It sounds like a Father's Day, but it will be a deliverance service. Because some people's future is linked to a Father's love. And there are others who have not experienced a Father's love. And it has a way of affecting their future. I came as a servant of God to pray for you this afternoon. To give you God's word and to pray that emotionally you will be healed in Jesus' name. Because it's dangerous to be hurt by the absence of a father's love. Because hurt people can hurt people. When you are hurt, you can easily hurt others. And sometimes people have painfully suffered at the hands of fathers who have not understood that they have a place to dispense father's love. And that the young men in the house will grow and change the narrative in Jesus' name. You may not have experienced true father's love, but you will not repeat that mistake in Jesus' name. You will find it somewhere, the strength within you to be able to offer genuine father's love to your next generation. But it will also help you to recover. Because true love gives. Amen. And true love also forgives. Now, in Luke 15, 11 to 32, we know the story of what we have come to believe and accept as the story of the prodigal son. The Bible says to illustrate the point further, Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. I want my share of the estate before you die. Now, I want it now. So his father agreed to divide his wealth. Now, if you read it this way, it looked like he best made one single request and immediately his father granted it. This suggests that there have been a lot of arguments back and forth and dad is thinking, it's not your time. Take your time. Take your time to mature. Take your time to prepare. You can't handle all of this. You are seeing all this wealth. If you don't know how it was made, how can you handle it? So fathers are protective. Fathers are wise. True fathers make sure that they give good counsel and prepare their children to handle the challenges of life. Because life is war. Tell somebody life is war. Life is not a very easy road. It is war. It's warfare. And you need to be prepared by a father because a father is a warrior. A father is supposed to be a warrior. When thieves invade your house, it should be your father who goes to the front first. Fathers naturally will put their children behind him and he will face the battle. That's a natural way of being a father. And a father is a protector. You can't let, when there's a father in the house, you, the invaders can't come in and he is hiding somewhere and say, go and face it. No, he goes first. He secures all of them and makes sure that everyone is safe. So he comes out prepared to fight. When our children were very, very young, across the street where we were, there were some robberies. And it feels like, so the police came around and gave instructions on how to protect yourself. And then one night, around 1 a.m., I heard a noise that feels like someone has come into the backyard. And so I got up first because I slept 
I went to bed very late and I hadn't set the alarm system on. So that means if someone comes into the house, the alarm system will not go off. And I wasn't sure whether the garden door, the door to the garden has been closed. Because sometimes when the children go to play there, they forget to lock it. And I was just wondering, we had it. My wife had it, so we both woke up. So what's the direction? I had to first of all make sure she stays in the room. And I went out to make sure the children are secured. And then I came down. I said, where are you guys? I'm going down. I said, but what if they are armed? I said, I'm also armed. <laughs> but I want to make sure that even if they overpower me, it will take them some time to locate my children. So I secured them. I, di- I didn't put them all in one room. I split them. And I did all this work quickly. And put their duvet on them in a way that if you enter the room, you wouldn't think there's someone there. And still left a little place for them to breathe. And then I have some weapon somewhere up there. So I went to take it and I headed down. And my wife was up there wondering. I said, don't call my phone. You just, my phone is with me, but let me go down. And I switch every light off in the house. Because I know my way in darkness in my own house. That's my territory. And then I headed down. Fortunately, there was no one. (laughs) But I went all the way through the conservatory and went to the outside. And pressed the door and realized it has been locked. So I still stood in the dark and raised the curtain to be sure who has invaded the garden. And then I went back up. So my wife later asked me, if there were people there, what would you have done? They said, it would be a bloody fight. <laughs> I said, I've called the police all right, but by the time the police comes, maybe I would have killed someone. <laughs> but I was ready. It's a natural instinct. I was ready to protect my family. I wasn't bothered about TV. I was more interested in protecting lives. Because when you lose one life, you can't replace it. But if you lose a television, you can replace it. But that is a natural thing. You, a father is a defender, a protector, and a father is a warrior. And so, the Bible says that this young man may have asked some questions. Probably every day he's coming with this demand and father finally yielded. Despite all the advice, he yielded and then he gave him. So, father agreed to divide his wealth between his sons. A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. About a time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land and he began to starve. Despite all the counsel his father gave, he didn't listen and he took his portion. And the Bible said he began to starve. So he persuaded a local farmer to hire him. And the man sent him into his fields to feed pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pots he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. Verse 17. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, Even at home, even the hired servants have enough food to eat and to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Please take me on as one of your hired servants. So he returned. Now these are the things he told himself before he started heading home. May God give us fathers that when we even mess up, we would think that they are good enough that we can return home. Sometimes fathers have messed up to the point that we feel that when we even mess up, we are afraid to consider going back home. But for this guy to realize that he has messed up big time, he could recall all the times that he was making this demand and his dad was saying, you don't have what it takes to manage this resource. You're going to waste them. Take your time. By the time you mature and by the time I'm ready to die, you have enough maturity, wisdom, and common sense to handle this wealth. 
if you don't know how the wealth was generated, you cannot maintain it. And so, with all that, the guy will be thinking about these things and think, should I go back? But I believe that there's something he saw about his father. That even before he, he asked for all these things and maybe flouted all instructions and advice and decided to even go, I'm sure aunties and uncles and all of them have been called to speak to him. And he said, no, give me my portion. When they gave him his portion, his father didn't realize he had sold even all the lands, sold the houses, took the money, and he's just going to enjoy life. And so as he went, but I'm sure that as he was growing up, he noticed something about a father's love. He realized that his father can be forgiven. That is why he said to himself, I'll go back home. There's no better place than home. I'd rather go back to daddy. I know he won't be happy with me, but there's something I have observed about him. That daddy is loving. That even if he doesn't restore to me all that I've wasted, at least I want to stay in his house. For that, that, that mindset to even think that I will go to daddy and tell him this is a sign that the prodigal son's father is an example of a genuine father. That's what Jesus wants us to see. The greatest manifestation of a true father is exactly this man in this scripture. His name was not given to us, but his actions is what Jesus wants us to emulate. This is a replica of a true father. The one that has a true father's love. That which represents what God intended for man. That which should be in every father. Because it's necessary for your well-being. Think about it. You've messed up so much. Look, you are now eating what pigs eat. And you know you have no portion anymore in daddy's house. Because you've wasted everything. But for you to even let it cross your mind. You know what? <laughs> Nobody's receiving me. I know I've messed up big time. Emotionally, you can imagine what is going to happen to this guy. He's down. He has not been able to do anything with the money that he gave to him. All the properties he sold. He's not married. He's messed up completely. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together and running over. He's messed up. Emotionally, he's down. He's a failure. To think about going back home, you look so, you know, it's embarrassing to come and you are carrying nothing with you. What is the point? What is the point? That can kill. You know, there are people that sometimes when you, you see, when you grow, you begin to understand a few things. You know, sometimes people leave Africa and come to Europe or let's say the United Kingdom. There are some people that some of you may have parents, probably now they may have regularized their stay or other parents still have not regularized their stay. So they are unable to travel. They don't have the documents it takes, but they have you here. Some of them, they came because they, they had to leave economically. Economically, there's nothing to write home about, so they have to leave. Some of them, when they were leaving to Europe for greener pastures, they had to borrow money to come. And they had to work to be paying that money. Sometimes you have no idea. Sometimes you are asking your parents for some things and they are unable to give it. You wonder, up, so you are working, daddy, and you don't, where do we know the money? He's paying some debt. Some money that was given to him to be able to travel, he's paying it. And there are some people, they are unable to pay this and then suddenly they are caught somewhere. You know, I remember an occasion where, you know, I was around North Greenwich and then suddenly the immigration enforcement people were all over the place and they arrested some guys. You know, they checked them and they didn't have the right documents to be in the United Kingdom. And they put them in their vans and they deported them by the next available flight to, to Ghana and Nigeria. They just sent them home. There are times they have invaded, you know, workplaces and get to the place and they are just doing a check. And there are people who are working. Some people's parents are working. They don't have the right documents. And they take them all. They don't take them home. Straight back home. And it's so embarrassing when you have to come back. And you haven't done anything for yourself. Some commit suicide on the plane before they arrive. Because they can't stand the embarrassment. And I remember my sister who is a very senior immigration officer. She told me a story about one gentleman who was taken from UK and sent to Ghana. He hasn't paid the debt. I mean, he came not too long. Luck was not on his side. He came just less than eight months and they caught him. And had to be sent back. You know, the kind of loan they went for 
to be able to buy tickets, do all the visa connection, and travel and come to England, hoping that he will find greener pastures and be able to settle down. That failed. Now, when he was arrested, he claimed that he's not a Ghanaian. And that becomes very difficult because he wasn't having a passport with him. And he has thrown the passport away so the immigration could not find it. And it becomes difficult for home office because once you don't have a passport and you don't, if you have, you know, some of the people, they know how to present their case. So if, if you present it that way, they don't know which country to send you to. Because if, if, if they, they think you are a Ghanaian and they send you to Accra and they say you are not, it's difficult to process you because the Ghanaian immigration will not take the person if you can't prove that he's a Ghanaian. And so for him, when they sent him to Accra, it was about three days and the argument was at the airport. He's not coming out of the plane. They forced him out of the plane. Immigration is not taking him because he believes, he says he's not a Ghanaian. <laughs> he says he's not a Ghanaian. But unfortunately for him, Unfortunately for him, there are some people who know him. Some people know him. So my sister was, was the one heading this team that is supposed to receive this person. And, uh, I mean, it was difficult back and forth. And then someone told my sister that, but, but we know him. He, 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 his name, his real name is this. Because he says that he comes from somewhere, <laughs> somewhere, Trinidad. <laughs> so he wants to be taken to another country. <laughs> he doesn't want to come home. <laughs> You know, so, they, I mean, eventually, they, my sister was able to trace his family. And they went to call his uncle, who came to the airport and saw him. And he spoke the local language with him and, and told him, let's go home. <laughs> let's go home. And he broke down and cried so much, but finally they took him. Out. Now, what I'm sharing with you is that this guy, can you imagine, the reason why this person, it's not that he doesn't love Ghana. But the point is that he hasn't, the purpose of his journey has not been fulfilled. And when he comes home, unfortunately, sometimes we come from societies that are vindictive. They make mockery of you. This is the guy that went to England and they, they deported him. You know, it becomes a stigma. <laughs> you know, and it's, it's it, I mean, people, people commit suicide because of that. You know, I have a cousin who was deported and he's not talking to any member of the family. It's been 12 years now. Yeah, because when he came home, they thought he has come on a visit. Then they realized that he's been hanging around for a very long time. <laughs> and then they started making mockery of him. And he heard those mockeries. And he moved away. And went to stay with some guys somewhere. So he doesn't come around family anymore. It hurts. Now, so you can imagine the embarrassment of this gentleman. And as he was coming back, but he decided, I will go. Because he knew something about his father's love. That if no one would take me in. I know dad will take me in. So he just came with a, a proposal in his own mind before he left to come back. Empty. Dirty. His perfume is pig's smell. He's eating pig's food. Staying with pigs. His, probably his, his, his skin, his complexion has changed. He has spots on him. Rashes. All kinds of things. He, he's not looking nice anymore. He's messed up completely. And he started making his way back home. And he decided, if I go, I will plead with my father. At least he should employ me as one of his servants. Because I know that for me, he will take me in. And so the Bible says, let's take it from verse 18. I will go home to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and earth. And I'm no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me on as a hired servant. So he returned home to his father. And whilst he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Church, whilst he was, on, he was further away, his father saw him coming. The father's love is able to still recognize his son or daughter, even if she's damaged. He can recognize. This guy is not recognizable to people. You know, the guy who left is now looking very lean, hungry, dirty, didn't have proper clothing on him. People wouldn't think it's him. People will be expecting the same guy who left. Probably he's now looking much better. He's gone to Europe or America. He's coming with a lot of stuff. He's coming with bags, suitcases. This guy came with nothing. Not even a rubber bag. Not a Ghana must go. 
<laughs> Not even any of these things. He's just walking like a sick man coming. But the father's love is still able to recognize his son even if he doesn't look like the one he gave birth to. He can recognize that. And the Bible says the father saw him from afar. The father, true fathers will be looking out for their children. He saw him from afar. The father's love is still searching. The father may not have physically gone out looking for him, but in his heart, he's been looking forward to seeing his son. And the Bible says he saw him from a distance. And the Bible says, look at that. Filled with love and compassion. He ran. Daddy ran towards what looked like a mess. True fathers don't say it serves you right. They will discipline and correct, but they don't gloat in the fact that you made the wrong judgment, wrong choice, and you are suffering the repercussions of it, and they are happy and say, yes, serves you right. See how life is. No. He ran. He didn't stand where he was saying, I'll wait for him to get here. We, we shall see. <laughs> He's coming. You know, he's not mo making mockery of him. The father's love does not mock his children when they fail. The father's love does not say you are useless. Nothing good can come out of you. Father's love can't speak like that. Because that child needs the affirmation of a father. So that they can do well in life. When life begins to hit at them, it is the confidence a father has given to them that will make them push forward. And so the Bible says, the father ran towards him, embraced him, and kissed him. Big smelling cheeks, you are, you are kissing that one. Are you serious? Daddy, pa, how can you be doing this? The guy's cheeks are smelling. He doesn't look like the one. You, if he's gone and wasted the money, it serves him right. But daddy ran towards that. Sometimes some of us have not experienced such a love. Any little mistake, the kind of words that are used on us, is enough to kill. It's enough to wound. Sometimes the words we have heard doesn't help us to reorganize ourselves to want to pursue the dream again. Because immediately we are told we are failures. When the guy returned, his father didn't say, see your face? See you? Failure. Failure. You know failure? Failure with capital F. Where, where are you coming? Stand where you're standing. Look at your face. Listen, all these insults will not bring the money back. The money is wasted. All those insults. You know the typical African way. Eh? Eh. That's why you won't feel like going home. So you feel like getting lost and continue to get lost until your life is cut short somewhere. Because the father's protection is not there. The father's protection has become mockery. You are afraid to go under that protection. May God deliver you from such a state. And may God give you genuine fathers. In the name of Jesus. Every wound you have suffered as a result of absence of a genuine father's love. May God himself restore you. In Jesus name. And heal you. The Bible said, then his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But his father said to the servants, quick. So his father is not even responding to what he's saying. When he came in with his proposal, his father turned and said to the servants in the house, quickly, 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 come, 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 quickly. And then he says, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Change his garment. The father's love changes the garment. Your clothing is a symbol of your glory. When it gets messed up by wrong judgment, the father's love changes the clothing. The father's love covers you. The father's love covers you. The true fathers don't expose their children to ridicule by others. That is the father's love. The father's love. Look, when your children mess up, when a true father's love, you correct them inside the house. You don't, you don't do that for people to see. We don't disgrace our children before others. It shouldn't happen. Because every form of disgrace 
removes some confidence from that child. And sometimes many of us may have suffered that. Where when we mess up, our parents made the whole world know that we have messed up. Now, father takes a strong stand. I don't want to see her anymore. I don't want to see him anymore. You don't want to see him. How about this guy? He's smelling pig. Pig perfume. Pig cologne. His hair is smelling pig. Every part of him, pig ministry. He said, bring out the best robe. And put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals in his feet. The guy was wearing nothing. He has sold everything around him. Except that he can't sell his body. So he has come up one way or the other. Sometimes we look like people who have sold everything around us. And yet there's no one to say, it doesn't matter. My son, my daughter, sit down. Let's get this right. Let's work this through. Let's work this through. May God give us fathers who will be there for us in Jesus' name. And so the Bible says that, it says, and kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast for this son of mine was dead. See, the boy came with a proposal. I don't think I qualify to be your son. His father still said, you are not my ex-son, you are my son. For this my son was dead. And has now returned to life. He was lost but now he's found. So the party began. Meanwhile the older son was in the fields working. And when he returned home he heard music and dancing in the house. And he asked one of the servants what is going on. He said your brother is back. He was told. And your father has killed the fatted calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him. But he replied all these years. I have slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back, after squandering your money on prostitutes, you celebrate by killing the fattened calf. His father said to him, look, dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day for your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but he's now found. Amen. You see, fathers love, not because they are promoting the mistakes of their children, but father, one of the reasons why a father naturally will love and must love is because Psalm 103, verse 13 to 14, says something very powerful. Psalm 103, verse 13 to 14. It says, as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame, and he understands or remembers that we are dust. See, what drives a father's love is that he understands that you are weak. That's what drives him to love. So when we make mistakes, a genuine father understands that we are weak. He said, as a father pities his children, there must be, as a father pities his children. That means that according to God's word, a father should feel some pity towards his children. But when a father is behaving like the child is his co-equal, and he's not showing any mercy towards the child, but it's abusive towards the child, it takes away the confidence of a child. Everybody wants someone who will encourage them. We all thrive on the oxygen of encouragement. Encouragement. Motivation. Someone who will stir us on to go on. You know, it used to be there naturally. But somewhere along the line, sometimes fathers miss it. Because when you have a little child and he's trying to walk, you find out that the parents will encourage the child to move. All my children, when they want to walk, sometimes they try it. Even when they have to crawl, sometimes they start crawling backwards. So you are there to encourage them to come forward. It's a natural thing you do. 
So when they are supposed to come forward and they are going backwards, you don't say to them, look at you, useless. No, that's a child. Why are you not saying useless to that baby? Because you know, he remembers our frame. He remembers that we are dust. So we remember this one doesn't even understand anything. So we stand there and encourage. I remember when little James wanted to crawl. Now, for him, he's had two brothers already. So he's, he's eager to do the things they do. He wants to run with them. Now he can't run. So now he sees more people because he's got two brothers and he's got a father and a mother. So he's seeing four of us. And whenever there's anything, we're all running to. He wants to run, but he has to be carried. And he's already an independent-minded boy. So he just thought, let me get down. And if we leave you down, you can't even move. So he quickly wanted to crawl. And I do remember when he started crawling. We still have the video. When we showed to him, he just shakes his head. But he, you know, he, he, he wants to crawl, and he's crawling backwards. So I remember one day we, we were all in the living room, and we said, come forward. <laughs> And he crawls backwards. And it frustrated him, so he started crying. Now, we didn't say, look at you, Oshahu, look at you. We didn't say that to him. <laughs> Osha means you, you don't know anything, you are blockheaded. We didn't say that to him. But sometimes you see your parents say that to you. And that shouldn't be. If we can't say that to that baby, throughout the life of the baby, we mustn't use those words. The father's love. But we were very patient to try to throw his... The toy he likes most, we were holding it and said, come. And then he tries and then he rather goes backwards. And it was so frustrating. It just frustrated. But we, we did that until he made his first move and he was so excited. He paused and he laughed and laughed and giggled for a while. And then he thought he has broken through. You know, he's just broken through one step. And that encouragement carried on until he made his first steps. He needed that encouragement. But if we made one move and then, for, I remember he just stood up for the first time he was angry and then he just dropped. We just said, look at you, failure. But we can't say that. And may we not hear those words in Jesus' name. Because that encouragement he had is what spurred him on. You know, he, he, he was there. Now I'm standing there and saying, daddy, I said, come. Daddy, I said, come. You know, I have to encourage him. And it really encouraged him. And he made the move. The father's love is an encouraging love. Amen. As a father pities his children, that pity, that word is a very strong word. It means that you have compassion, empathy, sympathy, all mixed up. That's the word pity. And you move because you understand this is your child. This is weak. This can make wrong judgments. May we experience a father's love. Psalm 68, verse 5 to 6, as I end the message. A father pities. A lot of us have not experienced the pity of a father. Sometimes you have even asked, is this man my father? Because he's always fighting with you. The Bible says, as I said in the morning service, it's a very serious responsibility to be called father. Because it is actually the title of God. And it was also his name, father. When Jesus came, he said, Father. He is Father. The Bible says, a father of the fatherless. That means it is not God's intention for anyone to function on earth without a father. The father is a very important aspect of our growth. But let me announce to you, even when you have a failed father, God can replace that person and your life must still go on. Don't dwell on the fact that I didn't have a father. No. Ask God to position someone else in your life so that the person will be a fatherly voice to you to take you to the next level. 
a father of the fatherless. And you must be determined that it doesn't matter what home you had come from and what kind of father you've had. Don't let that, I know it has an impact on you, but decide this afternoon that I will not let that affect the way I become a father or a mother in the future. Sometimes we have suffered as children because our fathers are angry with our mothers. So we bear the brunt. There are some people, they suffer in homes. Their fathers are angry at them as soon as they see them because they see the woman he no longer loves. And the child hasn't done anything. They take it onto that child. They're angry with their mother. You've had a child with her. You don't love her anymore or you don't marry her. But it doesn't mean you must treat the children that way. The children didn't ask to be born. But many children have gone through that. My father was not a very perfect father. He had his faults. Sometimes he took his anger on us because he's upset with my mother. We are no longer married. He's upset. And he's not supposed to do that. There were years that was happening until he finally came to himself. And he has to come down, track us to where we were living and come and say sorry to us. But that has been like five years of such, seven years of such. Now that's not going to lock me down to think, okay, I'm upset with the father, so that's how I'm going to father. No, sometimes I have to myself learn that I'm not going to make my father's mistakes. Amen. And get it right. Study, observe, learn, get it right, and change the narrative. Because he may be an angry man, and that also affected him. But I'm not going to let that, of course, when I trace his history, he was also very young when his father was murdered before him. So that definitely, for a nine-year-old firstborn, to observe your father's brothers come into the house, because your grandfather has wielded 90% of all his will and properties and everything to your father, who's my grandfather. He's wielded everything to him. And then his half-brothers were upset with that. Now, he was in England. He goes back home for holiday to visit his little children and his wife, and his brothers came for a normal visit. And so normally, when you get a visitor, custom and tradition, at a certain point, the wife goes out, little children are taken out, because these are, you know, daddies, uncles have come, eh? uncles and aunties have come, you are not supposed to listen to their conversation. Yes. And then they, after some time, with him alone in the living room, they decide to leave, to take their leave. So daddy's mommy, with daddy's siblings, were playing in the garden. And when they returned, they found their father in the living room, foaming in the mouth, poisoned. And so if someone had to grow up under this atmosphere without a father at the age of nine, probably there's some anger in him. And he also gets married, something to go well with the first marriage, and therefore he gets upset. So it bottled up inside him, and sometimes he takes that anger on us. But I was ready to change the narrative because I saw that it will affect me. May God help you to change your situation. In the name of Jesus. So yes, I had a father. There are times he's nice and cool. But there was a time where he kicked us all out. He's upset. He doesn't want to see us at all. But thank God he traced his steps. But that took some time. That took some time. I went through the first five years of secondary school. And it wasn't a nice relationship. He's upset. And it's not anything evil you have done. Just that he's upset with your mother. That's all. So it takes, affect the children too. And you could see that it has a way, it affects self-confidence. It was when I was going to sixth form. 
that he traced his steps and failed. And he said, sorry. Do you understand why he did that to us? That's it. Now, that's a long time. From year seven to till you get to year 12. That's a long time. That's a long time that you can't go near where he is. So you send the school fees remotely, but he doesn't want to see anybody. That's a long time. That's a long time to form certain habits in me. But thank God for Christ at an early age. Amen. And that changed something. So I'm not going to give that as an excuse and mishandle my children. No. You have to learn. Sometimes when you don't have something in your home, you also learn it positively from somewhere so that you chart a new course for yourself. Amen. So fathers love because they consider the frailty of their children. And the Bible says, a father of the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy habitation. This afternoon, you may listen to what I've said and say, I didn't get this one. I didn't get this kind of love for my father. And as I've explained earlier on, there are two things. Sometimes we have a physical presence of a father, but he doesn't even know how to father. Because probably he himself was also not fathered. And so it has gone on. And there are others that they have not even seen their father before. A few months ago, I met a very young nursing student. And I realized she's going through some kind of situation, so it demands my help. And as I conversed with her, I asked her, where is your mother? She said, I don't know her. I said, hey, what do you mean I don't know her? I've never met her before. She's 23 years. She has never met her mother before. I said, where is your father? I said, I've not seen him before. I hear he's somewhere in Europe. I only see his pictures. <laughs> but I have never seen him before. So I'm just wondering, this person has grown for 23 years. I've not experienced a father's love, nor a mother's love. I can understand why she feels so timid about anything. And there are people too who have gone through all kinds of things. But this afternoon I came to minister to you. The Bible says when we find ourselves in such a situation, because God is the God of the fatherless, and he understands that everybody needs a father who will minister a father's love so that you will be able to go on in life. There's something God weaved into a father that must be passed on to a child. That, uh, so everybody needs someone to be a father figure in their life. The Bible says God himself has declared himself to be a father of the fatherless. So the event where you don't have a father, God already has proclaimed himself to be a father of the fatherless. And he's not going to remotely father you, but look at what he does next. Look at the next verse. God sets the solitary in families. This is our hope in Jesus' name. The NLT says it so clearly. says, God places the lonely person in families. Amen. That means he's going to give you another father. It means that God does not like the situation where somebody does not have a father who will genuinely give a father's love. Sometimes you know that there is a father there. Yeah, everything you ask for, he gives. But you realize that there's a Something is missing. There's, an, there's not that emotional connection. That emotional connection is not there. And we need it to survive. We need it to go on in life. I don't know what you have been through with your father. But this afternoon, there is a father of the fatherless. And the Bible says he's able to place you into another family and give you another father. Who will be a mentor, a father, a voice. Someone that you can cry on. Someone whose shoulders you can actually cry on. Because just like that young man, the God's original intention for a father is that even when the child messes up, a father is an institution. He corrects, he disciplines, he guides, all for the betterment of the child. So if anything goes on and we are afraid to go to daddy, then there's something wrong emotionally with the relationship. And that's not going to help us. The guy messed up big time. Some of the things you are afraid to go back to your father to go and tell. This one is worse. 
Because he's wasted all the property, wasted all the money. He's also not looking very good. He's been eating what pigs eat. The alimentary canal of pigs is different from humans. The kind of things pig will be able to digest, humans can't digest it. The guy is eating all these things and he's walking. Probably he's even bloated, very lean, and he's just walking and he's coming home. But daddy's love recognized him. Maybe, may you be giving fathers who no matter how badly you are messed up, they can recognize you and still give you your place in the house. When he came asking for seventh position, daddy said, you are still sound. You are still sound. As a father pities his children, so the Lord pities them that call on him. May our fathers not die before their time. May they be genuine. May they be loving. May they provide for us. And that's the same thing with our heavenly father. Sometimes, as Jesus taught this lesson, he was teaching this lesson in the context of going after what is lost. Sometimes we have messed up with God. And we feel like, I don't want to go to church again. I'm lost completely. I have messed up. Church, a father to the fatherless is God in his habitation. That we can run back to God and say, Father, I have messed up. I've messed up. I've sinned against you. Please receive me. And God will receive us and give us another chance in the name of Jesus. Sometimes we mess up and we feel like the whole world is seeing what we have done. Run back to God. It is better to be in God's presence under God's discipline than to enjoy the delicacies of the devil. This afternoon, I want to pray with you. Wherever you are, I just want you to rise. I just want you to ponder on what I've said. I don't know whether I've spoken to you, but I want you to pray. Look at yourself carefully and say, Father, let me enjoy a true father's love. There are some of you who have not experienced a father's love at all. Sometimes you meet people, you smile, but in your heart, you cry. But we can't reverse the task. We can't reverse the clock. We can't go back to yesterday. We can't. But we can go forward in Jesus' name. There are times our fathers have failed us big time. What do we do? As a pastor, we see things, hear things, counsel things, do stuff. Sometimes you yourself, you are not emotionally matured. It can affect you. Because how do you comfort a 21-year-old whose father has been sleeping with her? She can't tell mommy. It's not like that mommy is absent. This is a depraved father. He's sleeping with his daughter. And she's going through this. And she's not happy. But she can't tell anyone. That's not love. That's lust. That's destruction. That's mentally scarring that daughter of yours. Such a person has not experienced a father's love. I have a case where it's not that dad is just sleeping with the girl, her, his daughter, but he raped her. So it's been consistent raping. And he has every excuse. Even, and I was like, how could the mom be so naive and not detect the signs? But it's the threat that she has received from daddy. That she will die if she dares tell anybody. Scares her with all of this. Now she's carrying all these things. When exam results come, she is not passing. Mom is trying to understand. But she and dad knows where the problem lay. She's not able to focus. She's going through torture. And yet she can't tell anyone. This is not a father's love. This afternoon, sometimes you may not have experienced a father's love. Sometimes your father may have failed you. I want you to pray the Lord. Manifest yourself as a father to the fatherless. Some of you need to be healed emotionally. Because for some time you have not heard any comforting word from your father except abusive words. Quarrels, insults, attack. So your father is attacking, ready to fight with you. It doesn't help in your mental state to academically focus on anything. Anything that, that disagreement comes with, it is accompanied by insults. 
Words of abuse. The Father's love is a love that heals. This afternoon, I don't know what pain you have suffered. What absence of a father's love you have experienced. Some have lost their fathers at an early stage. Someone else has acted. Sometimes they have failed. They have not handled you well. But the father to the fatherless is God in his habitation. And God will put the lonely person into another family. This afternoon I want you to pray that God will heal your heart. In the name of Jesus. God is a healer. If those few moments in my years, my dad had been loving when we were children, little children growing up. He was there for us until things changed. Sometimes they change because they married another woman. And that woman's influence means that they don't want to see their other children so as not to offend the other woman. Wrong choices, they make, they mess things up. Sometimes they are doing things to you that they didn't mean, but their circumstance is making them do so. But whatever the nature of the issue is, this afternoon you want to pray that, Lord, any wound, any hurt that you have gone through because of a father's behavior, that is not love as I have taught you this afternoon. I want you to pray that, Father, heal my heart in the name of Jesus. Somebody needs an emotional healing this afternoon. Because this is linked to something for your future. Lift your voice and begin to pray. Jesus, I feel the Holy Ghost is sweeping in the room right now. And it's going to change something in your heart. Some of you, you need to move on. Forgive your father. Be a Christian. Ask God to help you. Because sometimes they have failed, not because they intended to fail, but they themselves don't know how to do it. They could only make a woman pregnant. And that's why it stops. They think by just giving the money to buy baby food, they are doing their work. But there's no emotional, there's no chemistry. Holy Spirit, I have given this word. You alone knows the dimensions and the depth that you want this message to go. Touch the hearts of your daughters. The touch the hearts of your sons. Every son needs a father to function well. There are young men who don't know because they don't have anybody as a model. 